I'm not very high tech. In fact, you see this sort of uh, system that some of you probably haven't seen in your lifetime because you're too damn young. Uh, propping up your slide projector on the box, marking your trays, and you know, all this stuff, and are they right side up, and all this stuff. And, um, they don't even make these machines anymore. But everything that we've documented over the years uh, uh, is in slides, and we have thousands and thousands of slides. Uh, it's kind of hard to show you 30 years in, uh, in 60 minutes, but we're going to try. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of things that I don't have in here, and I think that this should be just a first try at uh, getting around the bush at uh, trying to figure out exactly how we can present uh, what Venus has done in this community. And I think that um, by showing you some of this, you can start to see the extreme energy that a place like this can generate. So it's going to be a little hard to push buttons in. And you're going to push buttons. Yeah. No, I can push buttons. You got it on? You got it on. Okay, we're going to push buttons and talk at the same time. Hold my hand. So I got out of college and, and I sit in the studio and I was lonely. <laughs> you know, you left all your comrades and your friends and, and all your buddies that were working with you four years from college and staying up late and making strange things. And it just didn't seem like, you know, when you had your own studio that there was anybody there to play with. So um, I, uh, um, started this uh, place down in the old market and it was a big Greenberg food company. It had been in refrigeration for 35 years and when they turned it off it was seeping and it is now called La Poulette and it is a wonderful place. But it was 12,000 square feet and I was there for 13 years after renovating it. We were studios and uh, we had a lot of different studios there. I think the rent was 50 bucks, 100 bucks a month, and if you couldn't pay the rent for the time somebody worked in the gallery. And we tried very hard to make things function. And we also, you know, wanted to expand what we were doing. And so one of the things I wanted to do in my studio was to try to get out of bringing an artist in and then just watching them work and not having to participate in a participatory sort of activity of working with an artist or working alongside an artist. So in 1981 over there, I decided to go back to uh, a place called the Omaha Brickworks, which is now about 72nd Hue. It's gone now. It's storage garages. But uh, it was one of uh, a few brickyards that were in this community that actually built this community. Uh, the play is dug right out of the hillside. You can see an aerial view there. And uh, we advertised this nationally, and we had about 30 participants to come work with and alongside Tony Hepper in our first year. The brickyard was uh, about all kinds of different bricks. Uh, the brick is a, a unit that's as big as your hand, about like that, that you can hold all day. It's about seven pounds. It works with your wrist and elbow, and you can build giant buildings. And so, you know, it's just a nice little play unit that the homo sapien can move around. So it's a very functional object, and Maury Cullen made them all kinds of ways. The one on the, the left there is clinker brick, and anything that didn't work kind of went down by the ravine and the trees sort of took them over. And it held the hillside together. And the brickyard was many acres, and you came through this uh, hole in the railroad bridge over there, it was said 1908 on it. And it had been there quite a while. And Maury also recycled bricks. Maury was a third generation brick maker. And when I used to come out there during my college days, because I was looking for something besides smooth, silky, earthenware clay, I was looking for something with a little toot. I could always buy a couple of bags of red clay for him and take it back to the studio. So one year I talked Maury into letting us all come out there to play. And so this is how his factory worked. He had a, a bowl. It was a hillside at one time, but he had drugged the bowl so often to get clay that he had made a bowl shape and he'd drag it over to a machine that ground it up and then that machine all ran off of belts off of this motor with the light bulb above it from an old Ford truck and the whole darn thing could jump along like a strange, strange sort of mechanical object and uh, this gentleman here is plays coming down from above him and into this hopper and water's dripping in and pretty soon he's extruding brick. That's Karen Levine here. 
came out and so if the bricks were bad, they went in that chute, they went back upstairs and came down in the hopper again. And then the bricks went into drying tunnels and the drying tunnels eventually led over to the kilns. The whole thing was under the mining act. I don't think it had anything to do with safety. There were no regulators on anything. There was nothing there. I mean, one of the kilns had completely blown up and there was no top to it. The, the whole thing gets banded together, as you can see. And bricks were just everywhere. Those bands are cranked together with chains when you're firing it. I don't think you shouldn't chain it together, it might just fall apart. But, you know, so the door went up with bricks and then you put smear clay over that and it just, no regulators, no temperature gauges on that burner. You just started it on fire. <laughs> and everything close to the burner got cooked to heck and everything in the middle was a little undercooked. But there was about 70,000 bricks in that kiln, and one guy in a roller bar unloaded them two at a time. So it had this great music to it. It would go, tickle, 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 all day long. <laughs> so we came out there with artists. This is Tony, and Tony decided to build these gates. And other artists moved into this stove kiln, which is a kiln with no roof to it, actually. It just has some metal on it, but you just pile bricks in there and fire the heck out of it. We're not talking about a period where gas is expensive. So everybody's working away here and making things and uh, we were using the machinery and using the sort of gift of industry which is multiplicity. We would be able to get a ton of clay forklift over to an artist within a second. This was, uh, this was uh, Omaha Gate and there it was in the making with Tony and inside the stove film. And this was it in the gallery later on. And this is, you know, one of 30 people that are out there working. And then this is it installed in the Chamber of Commerce where it went. It actually probably is now stored upstairs in this warehouse. And uh, the next year, June Kaneko came and he wanted to dig a trough in the hillside of the bowl. Uh, he had remembered digging a uh, well in Japan. And he liked the idea of sinking down into the earth and seeing how the relationship changed. So he started digging this trough that was going to drive, drop down into the bowl and he was going to paint the size of it. It rained. <laughs> <laughs> and when it rains in a clay place, it gets like this. <laughs> you can hardly pull your feet back up. It's like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> you walk him off. So he started thinking about building arches in different places. He was working around building arches around the kiln, he was building arches in the kiln doorways, he was building arches he could stand on, <laughs> he was doing all that thing. Judy Manellis was there and she was building big heads on the clay slabs. She started with, this is how she works in her studio, usually by building it by hand, but then she got all excited and decided to build it uh, out of the extrusions. So she had a big leap in her life there. This is the kind of head she ended up doing when she was there. Terry Rosenberg was very busy, graduated from Alfred. I met Terry on the East Coast when I was during the show, and I accidentally did it to do one of the assistant jobs in the summer. So he came out, and he was very busy and very uh, good at moving this play around into figurative forms. And they would all go then on top of the bricks in the kiln and be fired. Arnie Zimmerman, who was in New York, also came out and made very large vessels. Betty Woodman did a huge wall, which is also stored here, and I hope sometime it goes, maybe it would have a new ceramic facility. It's a beautiful wall. And she's sprigging, she's using large cake decorating tubes that she's had specially made for her. We extruded the tiles. We also worked with Doug Hollis and did a really wonderful sound path to a major sculpture in Seattle out of these tiles where he would, uh, we could die out of triangular tiles and he would uh, alternate them with aggregates of either seashells or rocks or grass. So as you walked up to the sculpture, you made sound by walking by. And Betty's tiles are always so gorgeous. I mean, they're just the fluidness of the clay. It's absolutely wonderful. Wayne Higby was there also and he wanted to work with uh, with the bricks as they were to try to make something decorative, like to try to figure out if I could do something better with a wall. And so he was playing with broken shards and he was playing with, you know, the patterns and the, 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 the sort of half bricks and things and making this. 
It's hot out there, your feet get tired. <laughs> we would barbecue out there. We also had to live together down here in the old market. It was, you know, not enough hot water and have showers. But it was, it was fun. The second year June was there, he decided to build a project in one of the kilns. And this was the first dungos. And uh, so he worked in that kiln with uh, three assistants. And it, uh, we had to film for a year. And a lot of things that you do for artists are a lot about negotiations. I think it's uh, so if you become a residency program as a dean assistant, you spend a great deal of time uh, trying to negotiate someone's dream so it can happen and try to make it happen. So we actually opened that kiln on a cold January day. And uh, had the, the dungos were a little bigger than the door, so we had to take a truck. So we had to start to land on fire in order to get it out. <laughs> it's a very primitive place, and we really loved it. I mean, I can't tell you that it, it, it was anything but great. It was really exciting to be out there. One of the things we did as a spillover here was we took over the old John Deere tractor showroom, which was where Tosh and Mr. Toad was up there. And it was the largest warehouse left in the United States. It was a block long and a block wide, and it was, I don't know how many stories tall. And it was a, a giant John Deere tractor sh place. And uh, the showroom was beautiful. Of course, that wasn't gray and it wasn't white, but we painted it over, it was a paint, and we stayed in there. We just clipped on lights, clipped on lights, and we stayed in there until it was too cold. I think we finally came out of there in mid-November or something. It didn't have any heat. But it was a great showroom, and we brought in parallel sounds couple of other pieces, and these drawings were done in the long. So that was a nice way of talking about, wow, isn't Omaha great? Everybody that came to the brickyard those three years, there was uh, over 100 people that came, loved Omaha. Some of them were from Omaha, but a lot of the other people said, why can't I do this year round? It's a really great city, you know? Nobody, they look at all these empty warehouses, and they were empty. The downtown was completely deserted. It was, uh, uh, I never felt like it was dangerous, but it was just empty. And it was sad. I mean, these buildings were very sad. This building, the Venus Bag Company, was given by the Venus Bag Company to the city of Omaha as a gift. The city didn't do anything with it for 15 years. It had holes in the ceiling bigger than this room. It had, it was drank, it was dark, it was, people were living in it. They were, unfortunately, burning some of the commercial artwork that made the bags to keep warm. Good thing they didn't burn the building down. But uh, it was just desolate. And then after 15 years, the city was sort of faced with the problem of uh, blowing it up for about $350,000 and hauling it away. So and you can see June's building too, the studio building there, all boarded up also that one. It was just, you know, you couldn't get in it. You didn't know if you wanted to go in it. <laughs> and when you did get in it, it was actually pretty amazing. Although it was peeling and the boards were coming up because of the water damage. And it was just so uh, drink. It was full of machinery too. And I don't have a lot of machinery shots here. But the paint was peeling everywhere. And, and we just, you know, it was just impossible to deal with. So the, thought was, how can we make this happen? I, I was looking around for a building, and the city of, uh, uh, Bob Peters, the city planning, had some HUD block grant money, and the merchants had this, gotten this building for a dollar because the city wanted it off their books. So that's not bad, a dollar, you know. <laughs> but it's uh, millions of dollars of investment. So we decided, how can we make some noise here? And we got Bob Peters and Mark Mercer together, and they decided they, they could do about 14 studios in this building and, and gallery space. So we decided to make some noise and we took these uh, sculptures back on the story where they had been for about two years where I was trying to find the building and, and brought them out, wrapped all the machinery and, and sheets and like a Christo wrap thing and had a party in there and, uh, and got people excited about maybe donating some money. And we started building some studios. And uh, this is a public of HUD block grant money. And we built 
very large studios with small kitchens and bathrooms. We wanted the studios to be places where people could live in. We wanted it to be variable. We wanted plasterboard behind, I mean plywood behind every plasterboard wall. Uh, soundproofing would have been helpful. That didn't help, but we did it. So this is kind of what happened, you know. The windows came back in. They just replaced the glass. Then we've got some lights going on there. We have a front door. We have people hanging out the back. Windows. We decided to do something with the alley, which was worse than the front. The alley had was just a mess. So we got in there with the city and we hosed down this alley and, and cleaned it all up and got rid of all the garbage. And we too, like the Venus now, wanted a garden. And so we uh, had a railroad track back there. Uh, the railroad cars used to go up to the warehouse behind the Venus. So we just added a couple of cement blocks and it was just wide enough for a dump truck and it brought in lots of dirt and scooted it around. And before you know it, we had a garden and it was just absolutely wonderful. And uh, planted all kinds of things and it became a place to have barbecues at night. We actually used to bowl in the alley. So it was kind of fun. And then art started coming. The first year, you know, we didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, really, we just hoped, we thought it would happen our years in the brickyard and our, our, our integrity about working together and how it was working out. So uh, we had about 84 applicants the first year. So uh, we were able to help about, uh, I think we helped, we had longer residencies then, they were a year long. So these are some of the people that were in those studios. They came from everywhere. Billy Dick from London. Vicky came from California. Some people worked very, very small. Some people wanted very, very large spaces. Shannon Tolan from the West Coast. Matt Dean, she was from the East Coast. And this woman teaches in Michigan now. She's a professor in Michigan yesterday. So we, and, and some artists are messy, and some artists are clean, and you know, it's just like always, I always thought it'd be great to do a slideshow of the same studio over and over. Because <laughs> the artists changed it. We, we gave them the studios blank. We didn't even put, back in the old days, we didn't even put furniture in them. We said they could go find the furniture they wanted. Maybe they didn't want a sofa. Maybe they didn't want a table. Who knows what they wanted. This is an artist from Mexico that came to us with an NEA exchange grant. And uh, on, the, on the right, it's a bird long from Texas. And here's some Berta Chavez, and this, he was another Mexican artist. We had a grant for four Mexican artists to come up, and he found one of my, one of those old postal uh, zip code sorting boxes that he was very involved with putting all kinds of little things into and photographing the series. So, keeping with our history of ceramic sculpture, we built the largest film we could get to in the United States. Uh, it was amazing when I walked into the European Ceramic Center in the Netherlands and they said to me, oh, you're the other, you're the third place. You can go to the European Ceramic Center, you can go to Shigaraki, or you can go to Omaha. <laughs> and we are, we were the only three places that you could do big work. And here's the chimney coming in, right through the window, up through an apartment. Who's toasty in that apartment? <laughs> This is Manuel Neary, who came to work. Manuel actually started as a ceramic artist. Uh, I went back to school in Chicago. And um, Manuel came and started to work in clay and then got a little frustrated went back to plaster because it was quicker and then went back to clay again and made some really beautiful pieces. I've seen these exhibited in national exhibitions in New York and on the West Coast. Tanya Regina da Silva from Brazil came to see us and she wanted to build a large sculpture and then three components, there's a little drawing. And of course she did it. So little old Saga was there working for quite a while with us also. He was very fun to play with. And uh, Nabuko came from uh, Japan. Nabuko deals with uh, Japanese uh, sort of fairy tales and things. And so she does all these kind of characters. And uh, Godzilla and things chasing each other. Around. We had a very nice 
down and say, so by the way, there's Debbie. <laughs>
and people do installations in all kinds of places in the warehouse. And this is Newspaper Children by David Finn. Very nice installation in the Old Venus Gallery, which is now the Blue Barn Theater. Uh, we had the, uh, the monks came in to do a thing we were working with home. And we did a very large sand and had a lot of people over several days there looking at those on that. And then taking it to the river, the river. Nigel Rawl, a Scottish artist, came in and worked with us. Uh, this was a performance piece. He has these long white stem roses, and she's going wandering back and forth in this room, wrapping his face in gauze with the roses. But he can't see, he just sort of wanders through memory. We also had a little bit of nudity in the gallery, of course, people doing things. This is a German artist who has three people reading in three different languages while he's performing. Uh, we've had music, Carrie Allen on the right was there. Uh, we've done several Terry Brown concerts. And uh, several other artists have been through the music. I haven't this too many. And if you might recognize this, this is a boiler room restaurant. But back then it was a boiler room that was sort of desolate. We did industrial piano in there. It was a piano made by Bruce Copeland, made out of a, like a piano with keys that you push. And the cables went to hammers that hit all kinds of things in that room. And we had actually someone from the symphony come and we had a nice concert there one evening. And it was quite enjoyable. <laughs> it's good sound down there. We helped put the Alice Acock together. We were the, the sort of home base for that uh, sculpture being created in Omaha. We uh, helped her with all the installation and everything that had to do with making that piece happen at the Med College of Sound at the Peter Kiewit Institute. David Nash's show was done with the Jocelyn. We actually housed that and had David here. Got all the trees for it from the parks and got all the open burning permits and all the things one has to do. We had a birthday, we were 10. <laughs> Some of the artists, of course, made the cake. And so we also have these great little auctions and all the artists in the back in those days we never hired a caterer. We couldn't afford a caterer. <laughs> but all the artists cook and that was always fun. This is a backdrop of the, uh, pieces by uh, Jimmy Walker. Johnny Walker. They're x-rays of prisoners that we found in an empty hospital in Kansas. Doctors love coming to that show. So you can see that we're making the food. People don't make your food like that. <laughs> and uh, there we are, Phil Schrager, wonderful Phil, trying to help us at an art auction. And we would manage to cram everybody in there and do it right there in that narrow spot in the gallery that worked pretty well. And oh, there's Todd. <laughs> <laughs> Todd is an early patron. That's a thin tie, Todd. I must be a good time for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's Bob Baker, too. And we had an educational program on the second floor. We felt very strongly that uh, something needed to be done in the arts education field, and we wanted to do something different. So it was called Cultural Arts Together, or CAT. The reason it was called CAT, because it used to be a CAT logo, a CAT the bag. And CAT's name was Sparky. And uh, Sparky used to live in this building when, he, when it was a CAT. So we got a lot of sparky mythology, so we did a couple of arts together. And it was great. This is, these are parents and children drawing each other. We had all kinds of classes. There's some Berto working with kids about teaching them how to do photography. And that's Troy is sitting there working with someone making musical instruments. We worked at, in school, so we couldn't get the kids to us, we would go down to the school. This school was learning about progressive vegetation and they made all these paintings and then we hung them in their school. We tried to do projects that were uh, that came all around to being something that you would do as a, a young person that got you involved instead of just watching somebody. So we give cameras to kids and let them do the John Carson show and interview show, you know. They'd interview their friends and they actually watch it. We talked about what's it like to a house, what's a house, what's a hut, what's a home. 
when we draw directly on the wall. I mean, kids are not supposed to draw directly on the wall. So the kids are working here at Brooklyn Bath, and those are aluminum uh, meatloaf pans, which look like bricks. We put them together with a hot glue gun, and the kids go, this wonderful hut. The person next to the hut is tall as a black and white L-shaped piece of paper, and as you walk by it, the figure disappeared. So the kids are playing with, you know, light and dark. We tell them about basic principles. Here we're teaching pointillism. We ask them to bring in their heroes. I think that's far enough so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, some people brought in their sister, or their mother, or their uncle, and that Senator Kennedy. Kind of President Kennedy. And so they learn about pointillism. And then we do something on endangered species, you know. So we were always uh, having a spin off. We took industrial piano and we adapted it for American Indians and did something with drums. So we had a Lakota artist come in and work with Bruce, who originally made that. We worked with other kids making instruments out of just found objects. We did this sort of, uh, we used to call this the Andy Warhol workshop. We'd take a picture and then just blank off the areas and write in numbers and let the kids paint away. And they would be able to do things with themselves and their friends and portraits. We took that same principle and tried it with disabled adults. And we were able to do a very interesting program with uh, seniors. A gentleman who likes to bowl and another one who likes to run. And of course, some draws. It's always fun. We also did, for uh, children, uh, mentally ill children, we did a hospital room for a playground. We were working with the artists and we did clouds and houses and all kinds of things. And bus shelters. And, you know, these things that come to your door sometimes that people want to get help with in the community. And we saw a good reason to do a lot of that, along with murals. We found ourselves, um, we were running a residency program, but we also were working with local artists and local people in the community to uh, do some enhancement of the community and try to work with some education. Because we knew the arts education was dropping out of the schools very quickly. So we were able to locate, I think over the years, we did about 15 different murals in the community. And uh, we've got all kinds of kids and all kinds of scaffolding. We're your insurance agents a lot. <laughs> but um, these murals did very well over time. We were very pleased with how they were received. And they were seen to never be damaged. Just when the kids were closing the gun shop and closing the liquor store and putting in the boxing club. They were all in the same game. And we also did one uh, very nice mural down in South Omaha, which is gone now. It's on the side of the grocery store. That was a nice one. We uh, managed to get involved with small towns and farms also. This is the first brick house in the state of Nebraska. It's hard to believe that a family with 12 kids lived there. But that was a very, uh, a house was available through a patron. We had residencies down in a small town. Uh, it says 200, but I think it's more like 25 people there. And we had the carriage house. And so we had two artists at a time down in Brownville working. We also started Art Farm. Uh, they kept the name after we left, after about three years. Art Farm was a conglomerate of barns stuck together. Uh, and a house down the road that used to belong to mom and dad. We got the house and it was kind of a place to work outside and do things. And we had several artists who expressed the desire to work outside and work on the land. So our farm was a pretty good relationship and they actually went on, kept the name, and do residencies now themselves. But they're work residencies where you actually work doing something on the farm and the residence. This is uh, Johnny Walker again. We uh, hustled all these sheets from the uh, hospital. <laughs> you know, the laundry service for hospital. Ty Roman down in Lincoln. Uh, and he had 300 sheets out of the farm, which were just beautiful on the way. The other thing we did was, uh, by chance, uh, we were selected with 14 other residency programs 
by the MacArthur Genius Grant category. They had some leftover money. They had $3 million left over that year. And they had suspicion that residency programs around America were doing something, but because of their nature, sort of reclusive as we are, we're somewhat reclusive, uh, that you don't see what's going on. The book that's being written here at McDowell at Green Cottage is not going to ever be read by anyone at McDowell uh, or presented there. The paintings done here are not necessarily always shown here. So the, the whole situation of residencies was that we didn't have any visibility. And uh, the gentleman there, Ken Hope, the MacArthur, was very suspicious that this needed some attention. So the Bemis and um, 14 other programs, 13 other programs received funding from $40,000 to a quarter of a million dollars each for their residency program. We were one of the two that got the quarter of a million. So these are some of the other residency programs in America. So immediately, I mean, obviously this doesn't look like the Bemis. <laughs> you know, this is a, 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 a kind of a large castle of Yada that kind of brought in and back from Europe and then left for the arts. A very nice residency program. But Yada and McDowell are the two oldest in the country, which are about 80 or 90 years old. Um, maybe they're 100 now. Um, but they were mostly for writers. 60% of residency programs in America are for writers. They're easy to handle, they're easy to deal with. They're retreats, they only stay a couple of weeks sometimes and you don't have a long commitment to making larger scale work or making a body of work. So, because the 14 of us got together and got very curious about each other, we decided to start an organization because we couldn't think of a name of what to call ourselves, because these residency programs are just as wiry and as unusual as the artists that go to them. Uh, we decided to call ourselves a fairly loose association of artist communities. Now, <laughs> now is that dating or what? <laughs> I don't know what we were doing. But we were the, the Bemis was the first office for the fairly loose association of artist communities. And we were their first bank, and we were the first person to survey, we were the first organization to survey the rest of the United States to see what was out there. There were these 14. There were a lot of others. Jurassi Foundation, for example, down down from California. It's 600 acres of ranch. It's a beautiful sculpture garden as you go around it. Uh, Carl Jurassi invented the pill. His daughter, unfortunately, an artist, unfortunately, decided to commit suicide on the land there, and so he decided to make a residency program. Centrum is a, a leftover barracks in Washington. All these places are so unusual, so wonderful. That uh, Cat Street is now gone, but it was one of the most exciting places in San Francisco. Headlands is again is an old barracks right across the Golden Gate Bridge. Fabulous residency program. They have slowly but surely taken over more and more buildings at the barracks, and it is one of the premier residency programs in the United States. So when we got together, we we decided that we wanted to make this organization bigger. Bemis was very involved, very much at the table. We actually did the first directory of residency programs in the United States. This organization is now, I don't know, Mark, is it 15 years, 20 years old now? It's Mark's probably, you're very involved on the board probably. Yeah. I'm starting in 94. 94? So See, I, I think we've lost a few. Jacob's Hollow only operates in the summer anyway with the theater people. Uh, Yellow Springs isn't there, I don't think. And there we are. There's the, uh, there's the Contemporary Institute of Art for Long Island at the time. It's called, it's called PS1, Public School Number 1. And the people in New York were changing their public schools over something functional. And of course, the Venus. And we were more like them than 600 acres off somewhere. We were urban. We had different issues. A lot of these people have runoff water issues, animal issues, territorial issues, things like that. 
that we didn't have. So each one of us found our own sort of mates, we might say, and uh, how we related and how we operated our best practices for our organizations. So it was really good we came together and built something, and, the, and it's a, a very outstanding uh, organization, and if you just punch in Alliance of Artist Communities and take a look at it, because it's very exciting. Mattress Factory was also very much like us, a very narrow building in, in Pittsburgh, and uh, it has a very exciting programming. Uh, Sculpture Space is the one that got the $40,000, and they have a very exciting program also. It's a, 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 an old shop, big machine shop that's been made into residencies, and you have a house that you live in in the community. And these are people that got together, came to Omaha and got together and have a meeting. And we have things that, whoops, it's backwards, whoops, there we go. Cultural diversity, cultural exchange, role in the cycle of the arts, relationship with local and national communities, link between communities. You know, we're very, very involved with trying to make things happen in this world. We're going to change the slide trade. So, I think that the Venus here in the middle of the country, which quite often uh, is not recognized, they have done a lot uh, for fostering a uh, movement of residency programs uh, for artists. The, uh, I remember early on when I used to go to the East Coast and take my, my slides and my printouts or whatever, to talk to somebody. The minute I said I was from Omaha, Nebraska, they would sort of get glazed over and, and I think it was an Oklahoma or something. Oh yeah, it's not an Oklahoma place there. <laughs> so I decided after two or three trips to New York and losing my uh, ability to keep people's concentration, that I would actually uh, never tell them I was from Oklahoma. <laughs> Here you can see there are five windows and then there's four windows. 
And then next to it was a beer uh, beer company, and then burned it burned down. And I don't know what happened to the building in the back. I never found out. And uh, this is from the, the collection down at the uh, Western Heritage Museum or the Durham Heritage. And this is what it looked like when I bought it. It was not a street. It was just mud. Um, there was a railroad track along the Okada and along the, the dock, the South Dock. Anybody that took that street is crazy. Uh, and a lot of people used to take it between the two buildings, in between the Okada to the north. They would take that area because it had some concrete on it. What happened here was that this little building, the Okada, was a place where the railroad cars would come and they would unload supplies. And the trucks would come. There's only eight big doors on one side and 16 on the other. Trucks would come and get the supplies and, and load on that north side. In front of the the we had we had a lot of great ideas. I mean, we had wonderful ideas. I worked with the um, Bill Bill Starr over there in the architectural offices, and we came up with models. You can't really see it, but we had a closed glass atrium all on the side. We were worried about utilities. We had a sort of warm generating uh, pyramid on top. <laughs> but this is what it looked like. I mean, it was, I mean, it had its windows all blocked up. And it, it had a tenant in it, actually. It was uh, made crates for uh, weather equipment, for strategic air command. So we got the tenant with it. And it was just, there's that street, you know, it was just a mess. That's before it turned to mud. And the, and the dock doors, a couple of them worked, and most of them didn't work. And it was just, uh, it was just a CD mess. It was kind of like the end of the old market. It didn't even come this way. Big semi trucks. You can see the railroad tracks up there a little bit. So we started working on it. We, you know, we we stayed over at the old Venus building and we kept this building and started to work on it. And so here we new, new decking on the Okada, new roof. This is uh, 16 years ago, 16 or 17 years ago. Inside the Okada, we ripped out the false ceiling. We had about six offices in there, and it was a it was a the Milwaukee line. The old Milwaukee train line. And then they put in the street. Lo and behold, they poured that big concrete street. And we still hadn't ripped off the dock. And so we had a brand new street all of a sudden. And it was kind of like a bright new day. <laughs> People were like, I planted trees. <laughs> Cute little skinny trees. <laughs> and we still had a dock that <laughs> was covered up. <laughs> And then we replaced all the soil. We took out all that concrete that was there for years of junk in the soil. We put all this soil. And when we got down to the back of the Okada, we found a, a, a basement of some other building that had been there. So that all had to be dug out also. So we put in a lot of nice soil. And then we hit the dock. So we tore things out started ripping away the front and we peeled it back to see this beautiful brick facade and the top of it. There's wonderful arches in the front of this building. And we just kept, we did, the other thing is that we were able to use the stock in a different way. We, 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 we promised the city we wouldn't park trucks on the south side, we wouldn't cut off the street. As you see, it happens across the way over here in the lot. But, so we cut that and we decided to enclose it. This is the front dock on the left, and this is the south side dock, which goes down to the underground now. So the idea was to, uh, this looks like the front right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey gosh, we're doing it again, look at that. <laughs> so uh, what we tried to do was to save the dock and not cut into it. So I talked to the city and they literally moved the street over a bit, so they gave us an extra lane there. So it was really nice that we have a little extra land there, and the dock is really wide, because it's very valuable property now. So here we are, new roof. Oh, windows. My goodness, there have been windows in this building forever, and I am so thankful. Thank you very much, Todd. We have windows. 
<laughs> and so we could only afford the second floor windows, you know, at that time. And inside, again, was like the old Bemis, a mess. These proud warehouses that were built on a so much lumber, when you look at these huge timbers in each one of the trees, uh, you know, they're just beautiful spaces. Of course, meeting fire hose, we had to pour concrete, and that was good because the floors were pretty beat up anyway. And so we started to make a change. We started to brighten this area of the neighborhood. We started to have people come down here. People started to find us put up a sign and hope people would see it. <laughs> and we let artists use the warehouse space because it was legal to use on the other floors. It wasn't illegal to use. So here's Wilton Alston who moved up here from Kansas City and was eventually became a professor uh, at Creighton. And Littleton had this whole floor. He just loved it all himself. And he was making these giant cones. These things were about eight feet tall. Uh, different materials and hanging them from the ceiling. Stephen Marsden took the pillars and, and actually made a, a bloated pillar in the middle. And then uh, another artist came along with a bunch of cloth and made an enclosure. These are radios that hung all over one floor, tuned to different stations that would come and go uh, all at once. It would be noisy as heck and you could stand it in there and it would just be a whisper if you got up close. These are little mice. This is in the underground, right where you go down. It wasn't opened up back then. And these are uh, the mice trying to do This artist grew the mice, raised the mice, put them up there for about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and documented them. This was a camera obscura that I, I wish we could install again sometime. It's a small slit. The rest of the windows blackened out. The whole length of the warehouse was uh, uh, material, translucent material. And so it inverted the environment and brought it into that room. And unfortunately, I do not have them. At least I couldn't find a photo. So these artists would take off anywhere in this building and do things. This is a paint the floor, they could install things, they could make things work. We had all kinds of people coming to us for that kind of situation. Young, this woman came from Israel. She works with earth and stone mostly. And so at the same time that this was happening, they were also had torn down a lot of Jobber's Canyon, so we had some big cornerstones that we could give her that she was working on. This is an installation of screens at the back of the Okada. This is uh, Sean Cassidy did another installation of cast concrete clothing. What year is this? Oh, I don't know, honey. You have to look at this slide. But that's why we're going to do this, right? <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe, yeah. Some of the, well, a lot of people in this room have been around. <laughs> it's a Japanese artist that came that likes to bend steel by hand, so he's kind of like a huge blacksmith, and he was making a large piece for the city. Thurman Stadium was our first show on this side, and we had just one side before we had exit to the south, to the north, I mean. So he built a big glass tower and a big glass installation in the house, and that was up for about six months. Thurman had since then moved to Omaha and has his own really nice studio. David Helm from the University of Nebraska Sculpture Department. Did a sort of a lost journeys, projections, and installations. Chris Romer. The Okada got used a lot. I mean, it was hotter than hell in the summer. It was freezing cold in the winter, but artists would use it. And we liked that. We could put enough power in there that they could use something, at least some of it. It's an artist from Germany. We had a lot of artists doing this in Germany. We really liked them. We really liked them in Germany. You see these little, these little pieces of wood are installed in a way that make a figure in the shadow. These are both Japanese artists. The, the figure is done by a woman, and the other artist is actually very, very well known now, and now lives in Japan, and uh, shows in New York. 
These are uh, 65 televisions uh, around this, this room, actually. Uh, isolated images of uh, soap opera. Maybe it was. Yeah, right? Restless. Young and restless. restless. Right. That's right. And we got we got to grasp the French Mart and beg the beg the televisions. They gave them all to us. And then they didn't give them to us. They sold them to us very cheap. And then we resold them to like the Plasma Police Department. <laughs> it's just like that. <laughs> Anything we can make work. <laughs> you know, artists will take you a lot of places. You know. All right. We did, this woman very lightly spent drew all these words on the floor of that upstairs. It's just amazing. This, this drawing, these drawings on these, these boards with many layers of paint, as you see here, are done with a chainsaw. I've never seen anybody be so elegant with a chainsaw. This woman was uh, making a mold of her head, there you see, and it was going to pivot and erase her mother's image on the wall. The, 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 the head was going to be made of an eraser, and it would smudge out her mother. And it was an artist that was dealing with the fantasy of being a butterfly. This is a very powerful installation. This was amazing to walk in the gallery. It says, the body of a dead enemy always smells good. So it was all that we had, the Peerless Rack Company was down here. We had so many clothes and bags. And we had so many artists who made tents out of these clothes. They made all kinds of things out of this clothing that we had around in bags. Of course, we had wonderful painters. I mean, we get taken away sometimes because of our space, because of the installation space we have. But we had wonderful painters, like Anne Francais there on the right, who's who deals with flowers and abstracts these flowers out in these large canvases that she just directly staples to the wall. And this one is one of ours, actually, the Venus. I think this was the last time I saw it, it was kind of like her. Go along, who worked with rice sack. She's Chinese, and she worked with all kinds of stories of people's history and rice sacks. And Flo became very well known in the area that shows around people dealing with oil barrels, oil issues. There's a large fountain on the roof that came down blowing a sort of uh, green water in the antifreeze or something like that. I don't know how fur pain went that. There's a trailer. This trailer's being sewed up by Matt Lynch. He made the base of the real fountain. And he's sewing all the blue jeans together. And he inflated the trailer and took it down to the car show in Texas. He also made a second trailer out of old billboards and put the inside over. He was in the trailers. Mo Neal from Lincoln. Oh, yes, I'm good. good. This, these things would breathe in the gallery. These large, empty, sort of latex membranes on the right there that would inflate and deflate in the gallery. This is a small piece you walked into. But openings were always fun. We always had a lot of people come to openings. We did barbecues out back. That might be you in that hat there, Tom. <laughs> and that's Joan. We did, I couldn't find the pyrotech slides to save my life. We had an amazing pyrotech performance. And I just, I ended it with this because this is what you're doing right now again. And we're doing it again with Jeff Day. And this was a charrette we did many years ago about planting across the street at the Okada. What we did was we teamed up with the University Department in Lincoln and the students took us on as a project. It didn't mean that we would do these things necessarily, but it became something they could get their hands on. Crawled all over the building, measured everything, and came up with all kinds of wild, crazy ideas. And uh, actually, some of them made sense. So uh, it was a kind of an interesting thing. We did a big thing in the, in the gallery where we put down textures on the floor and different kinds of grasses and coverings and uh, tried to show people what we were thinking of doing with the land outside. And uh, we had actually, one of the things I always wanted was to have some um, energy, energy generating windmills on the roof. So what is it? 
Is it, is it the buildings that take us and make us important? Or is it the people? Is it the community? What is it that makes this place? Um, and I don't have current slides, so you see what's been built south of us, and you see the rest of the organization. But what is it? Is this humanity of looking for ourselves or trying to express ourselves that makes a difference here? What is it that made the Venus survive and succeed? I think it's I think it's because of all the energy in this building and everybody who's been here and worked here and all the people who uh, invested in this organization believe strongly in it and still do. So um, that's all I have to say and I hope we can do this again. Maybe every six months we'll pull out some more slides and Mark will add some more stuff to it. We'll finally get this into something that uh, you know, uh, can be a really good tool, and I, we tried when I was here to keep track of the artists. It's kind of hard to keep track of everybody. You've got 700 and some artists, and some of them are not artists anymore. You know, it's a tough world. Actually, uh, statistics I used to know years ago is that uh, five years after graduate school, only 10% of the people were actually working as artists. And in 10 years, it was under 5%. When we were in London, uh, Jim was getting an honorary doctorate from the Royal College of Art. Uh, they had a student exhibition up. So I asked them, I said, well, how do you guys, you know, how do you know these people are going to survive? He says, we have for 35 years now followed our graduate students. And 95% of them are still working as artists. So one of the things that we're going to try to do at the International Sculpture Center right now is to try to find out why there's a difference. What is it? Is America just too young? Mm, 200 and some years old, maybe, uh, to appreciate the arts? Uh, is it that the college on that end of the water is actually doing more at putting their people to work somewhere? Uh, why are we having this drop out? And why are our residency programs actually best institute in the world to help us. So that's all I've got to say this time. We'll get together again. State University Arts programs, for instance. It would be an interesting statistic to find out. Even Gallup to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah? You know that. Get down. Get down. What is that statistical set of that? Right. Does anybody have any questions about any of that stuff? How much time, Stan, did we just go through? You didn't mention years very often, which is fine, but I, I want everyone <laughs> to know how much time was that? When did you start? Uh, I, I first, when did you start the first? In, in on record. I came down to the Yes, that was your first gallery. But the first Bemis nonprofit yeah. artist residency was started in '84. Yeah. And that and this and this slides took us through '99. Right. So Mark, what did you get? '03. '03. I think that's what it said. Yeah. To 20 so, years. Yeah. Uh, almost. Almost so exactly 20 years. Yeah. You guys were decades in the Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm sorry, I don't have Catherine's. Catherine had a fabulous installation here in the front gallery that was very avant-garde. And we did it, all these lights and music, and she collaborated with somebody. Kevin first. I have Kevin first. Okay. And I don't have any. I don't. My images are terrible. 
So Catherine told me tonight she's getting me some good energy. <laughs> it was hard because of the way the light was. It looked like it was on fire. Yeah. Have you ever created the ultimate Diva Facebook page and feel where are they now and so figure out how all the artists can post images and whatever? Well, it'd be nice yeah. to find all the artists. Yeah. Well, now it's easy to find people through Facebook, but how did you find all these artists? Well, they, all the applications, we used to send them out by mail. Right. And do it, you know. You're going to get a thousand applications it. now. When you start reading it, you're going to get a thousand applications. <laughs> Wait, do you remember, do you remember that you had the college university art department mailing program and you put a poster in a big in a nine by twelve envelope and you'd send it to the art department and hope that it would end up on the bulletin board in the you know in the hallway at the art school. Right. You tried like hell, you know, you advertise it. You know, it's just trying to get people to come to Omaha. A lot of people didn't think it would happen, but it sure did. You get like a list of university art department um, he department heads on sticky labels from from um, Vin Gupta's company. That's right. <laughs> what was it called before? It was Info USA. It was called American Business List or something, right? Yeah, something like that. It was expensive. It was like two hundred bucks. Killed us. <laughs> But it's been very exciting. I tell you, artists teach you more than anybody else in the world. Artists are very good at teaching you things. So I always enjoyed that part of it. So. Can you talk about what the demographic of people was pre Venus? Oh. As far Here. as, well, I guess just people, you know, obviously right now Omaha has a lot of people that support the art scene, a lot of people that show up. For shows where they're yeah. buying stuff or not, but a lot of people that are getting involved in it, and it's somewhat of a rarity around uh, in most cities. And um, I mean, it, it's just you can't help but make a correlation between how much outreach seemed to happen among young kids, and then how many people are coming here. How many of them are those same faces that probably were affected by it earlier? So it, it's kind of that idea. Now you saw the audience started to, you know, I guess build your own type of demographic, but was Omaha somewhat of an artistic community and a community that was supporting stuff to begin with, or was it I, kind I of like... I would say came? that Omaha's always been a good theater town, a good music town, and the visual arts, when I came along, was a town um, that was very, uh, the poor sister was the visual arts, I thought. We had the Jocelyn, but it was really very stuffy, you know, quiet. Yeah, it's kind of like you were in there and you thought, God, they're watching me. And, uh, you know, they, they did some art education classes, but not very much. And they, they always felt that they were being annoyed by doing them <laughs> sometimes. But they're completely different now, too. But I, I do think Omaha's always been a theater town. It's been a town where you kind of came in and got a good show and your supplies and went back out. But we do have a lot. If you go down to the Durham Heritage Museum and you look at the photographs, there are big theaters, one after another, downtown Omaha. Huge theaters. Some of the best stars came here on the train system. But if there was a gallery here. It was one of the floor was ceiling salon. It was a great picture of them. But there wasn't a lot of activity. In fact, the, when you went to school here at the University of Nebraska in Omaha, you were literally told to get out. Right. Get out of there. If you're going to be an artist, get out of here. First of all, I wanted to be a sculptor. I couldn't be a sculptor because women aren't sculptors. <laughs> <laughs> there was only a few. You know? You're not going to make it at that. No way. You never get a teaching job. So ceramics was a good one. Marie, when was the fire? The fire? Over there at the old Venus? We were out of there. Yeah. We were out of there by then, thank God. They were repairing that roof, the area that used to be as big as this that was open for 15 years. And it had been repaired, but not very well, and they were repairing it again. And I think the roofer left something on. <coughs> it was very sad. It was, it had to have been like late 90s, early 90s. I know I had a cell phone yeah. because it started ringing in New York. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't that long ago. I was in New York, and people were like, the beam is on fire. I'm like, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think 
where that left off 10 years ago and your opinion of the 10 years that um, ha has happened since, did you think it would grow to this extent um, w w w when, when you stepped away as being the executive director of day to day operations? I know you had hopes for it, but did you think it would get to this level? Yes, I really thought it's, it, it's not done, you know, it's not done yet. Right. We've got many more floors to do. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's got the potential of being one of, I think, one of the most significant places for the, for the arts. And it, it can go a lot of different directions. I mean, with the technology now, it's much easier to operate these kinds of residency programs than they were in the past. But, um, I mean, nobody needs a video editing room anymore. You know, yeah, right, right, right. Uh, I think that the, what's happened is that it's, it's really, with Mark here, it's taken an anchor in the community. I was very busy trying to bring people into the community. And Mark is very busy anchoring Bemis in the community. Mm -hmm. Like the feet are kind of going out now, the roots. Right. And I was just busy grabbing people from Germany and England and anywhere I could and get them to come here to discover it. And then Mark just did something different with it. But we're still doing that. Still we're bringing people in from around the world. And I think that's very important. How many get added to the mix, you know, really nicely? We have thousands. Oh. Is there going to be at the at the 30 year um, on the 20s, right? Is there going to be 25th? Is there going to be something about what what exactly is going on across the street and what exactly that facility is going to become? It's going to be like a presentation or good. <laughs> 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 okay. I really am ex yeah, excited to see what is happening over there. It's very great. And that's something that always wanted to happen. And that's something, you know, you couldn't put a, we came from a ceramic sculpture history. We, as I said, we're one of three in the world, excellent programs for ceramic sculpture. So we feel like honoring that history, but at the same time, there was no way I could put a kiln like that in this kind of a building. It's a wood structure. I took a chimney all the way up. That's why I was dying to get that piece of property across the street. What became of the old kiln, the one in the, in the old Bemis? Is that we still active? Uh, the nurse said they would uh, not make me take it out by the time it was So I found them a tenant for $700 a month. Are they still there, that uh, ceramic? No, they service? moved, and it's uh, oh, Ted Harnick oh. now, isn't it? Oh, Ted Harnick is no longer ceramic. But there used to be a tile company there for. Well, yeah. Uh, what was the two guys that were making tiles and somebody else? Were, oh, it was uh, before Hot Shops. Clay, well, Clay works over there now. Yeah, no, it's before Hot Shops. The guy from Bellevue. Jim Barrett. Who runs the, the Hot Shops? The guy who teaches at Bellevue. Uh, Les. Les. Yeah, Les is running it over there with a good couple guys that had a uh, architectural tile business. A lot of architectural tile murals. Yeah. Is it still operating now? Yeah, T Tom Harding is running it. Where did you get that apartment? Tom, actually, I met Tom at the brickyard. Yeah. yeah. The apartment with the chimney. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I see friends at Howard. We had to run across the floor. cultural infill that I think should be addressed somehow through the Bemis and how that's working out. You see it happening on the north side now. And it's, it's very interesting how the downtown is just coming back to being down here. People would tell me they'd never go downtown, they would never go to the old market, they would never, why would you go downtown for it? There's nothing downtown. Right. So. What about the, 
freezer. Oh, this guy over here. Oh, yeah. Is he stubborn? No, I don't think he's stubborn. I think. I think I know he pays thirty thousand a month for keeping that place refrigerated. <laughs> You uh, wanted to put a, a, a visual college. I, I, I wanted to put a design center. Yes. With Parsons. Yeah. Parsons School of Design. And uh, and maybe Mr. Carey and June have been talking about when he was running the new school. New school. And Parsons, the new school merged. And then he was building another Parsons in Paris. Or someplace. <laughs> I said, why don't we build one on a cheaper? And I think it would be great with all the new upstart companies yeah. and, and innovation going on to have a design community here also. It would be a real nice pair to us here at the Beemans over at Conecco. kind of works. So. Well, thanks for coming. Thanks.